All right, here we go. Well, if you were paying attention to the news in November of 2005, then you're likely aware of part of my next, my first guest story today. It was late that month that he and three other men were kidnapped at gunpoint in Baghdad, Iraq. Their Christian Peacemaker Team's delegation, a group of pacifists from Canada, the U.S., and Britain, were in Iraq to use nonviolent intervention to protest the war. The four were held hostage for months, handcuffed together, subsisting on very little, and taunted with promises of release. American hostage Tom Fox was killed, his body dumped, a message that the hostage takers wanted their demands for U.S. release of Iraqi prisoners taken seriously. Then, more than 100 days after their capture, with prospects for the safe return of the other three peace activists looking grim, came a daring rescue by British and American special forces. James Loney has grappled with the many ethical dilemmas of his capture, his captivity, and rescue in his memoir titled Captivity, 118 Days in Iraq and the Struggle for a World Without War. And James Loney joins me now live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Good morning, Sean. I've been looking forward to this. This is a a, a very powerful book I've been uh, telling people about. Thank you for your candor in the book, and thank you for agreeing to come in. Thank you. Most of us are familiar with the news accounts of your story, what we heard five or six years ago and then in the aftermath. But when people ask you about it now, how do you describe what happened? Well, it is uh, it is hard to describe, to boil down into uh, a few words. Um, but I, my mind always comes back to the first few words that I uh, used, the words I used to describe it, when I got back, which is uh, profound, terrifying, um, uh, excruciatingly boring. Um, uh, it was, um, yeah, I, it's, it's hard to boil down into a few words. You talk about both the terror and the boredom mm -hmm. of captivity. Yeah, it's, uh, people are often surprised, uh, but boredom uh, was, perhaps a, a harder uh, reality to, to deal with than, than fear. Fear kind of, there were these peak moments uh, of intense fear, terror, but generally that kind of faded into kind of a white noise in the background, and it was just the excruciating boring, boredom of getting through the next five minutes and next five minutes. Just was like, just being in time was torture. Almost. It's hard. It's hard to imagine living through what you lived through, uh, let alone reliving it, uh, as you worked on this book. What was the hardest thing for you about going back to this part of your past in order to write about it? Um, it uh, it 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 took me a while to figure this out. But it was like getting up every day and going to work at the kidnapping. It uh, and it was. In writing the book, I had to put myself back into that room, back uh, into the handcuffs, uh, back into those plastic chairs uh, with uh, Norman and Tom and Harmeet and and the captors, and um, it uh, it just kept going. It took me so long uh, to do. And um, were you scared about the idea of reliving this? Um, not really. No. Um, it uh, it it just it, I thought oh when I started oh this will take me like maybe three to five months I'll be done and uh, mm. someone said oh it'll take you a year and I was like I was like oh no uh, that it couldn't possibly take me a year right and, uh, I've already been through this once and it was one of the things that happened I'd be sitting you know at my computer and I would just be overcome with this incredible fatigue and I just would have to have a nap. Sometimes I'd have like 10, like five minute naps uh, during the day just to, uh, and it was, I think it was just the, the boredom. Y you write that it was important to you that the RCMP return the items they took for evidence, your clothes that you wore during captivity, even the handcuff. Mm -hmm. Why? They were, uh, it was this th physical link to, to the experience because uh, it, 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 it was just over in a finger snap and, um, and so it's, they're like, yeah, it really did happen. You kept a journal during part of the time you were held. You, mm -hmm. you write about the incredible range of emotions you experienced from compassion for your kidnappers to rage uh, at your fellow captives. Your emotional honesty is it, it's startling at times, James. Which, which part was the hardest for you to expose? 
Um, well, um, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to convey that captivity is a profoundly ugly experience and, um, that, uh, and that it, it evokes in the person, I think, who is captive, uh, a huge range of emotions, a lot of it very ugly. And, um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't want to idealize the experience or my my role in it. I wanted I wanted people to have a sense of what. Um, How would it be idealized? Well, I think sometimes people um, come up to me and say, "Oh, you're you're so brave, or your story is so inspiring," and um, and uh, I'm grateful for that. But I but I also um, I feel like I'm. Uh, just an ordinary person like anyone else that that had that went through this experience. This is the first time that you've really told the story of your captivity, and and although there's been innumerable stories told mm -hmm. uh, in the news and by others, was there something that you wanted to say? Did did you want to set the record straight? Were you disturbed by the way this was being portrayed? The important thing for me was I felt like this room that we were in this. Uh, seven by 12, 11 foot room, um, cut off from the world, nobody knew where we were, that everything I needed to know, I felt at times, everything I needed to know about the universe was in this room. Um, everything I needed to become a whole and complete human being. And um, I felt like I got to learn things and see things that I wouldn't in my ordinary life. Um, and. Uh, and I, I guess I wrote the book to, um, to share with people through the stories um, uh, of what happened to us. Give an uh, example of that, something you, you would see in captivity that you wouldn't see in your normal life. Well, um, I mean, or understand, I guess. The, the, we, um, as you mentioned, we were handcuffed to each other, left hand to right hand, and kind of sat in this row of, of chairs. And uh, sitting, uh, you know, it's hard to do basic things when your left hand is handcuffed to somebody's right hand, like drinking out of a glass or even scratching your head. And um, uh, and the captors gave us this Pepsi bottle that we used uh, to uh, relieve ourselves um, if uh, from time to time uh, we couldn't get their attention to, to go to the bathroom. And um, so peeing into the narrow aperture of a pop bottle when your hands are handcuffed to somebody else is uh, uh, a bit of a challenge. And if it isn't just exactly right, you get uh, a mess of urine on the floor. And uh, so one day we're using the, the bottle and uh, uh, things don't line up just right and we end up, we have this mess on the floor. So we use our rag to clean it up and hang it on the back of a chair. And then our, uh, one of the captors um, brings us lunch, uh, an Iraqi flatbread called the Samoon. Uh, that day it was eggplant. It's oily. He's got f grease on his fingers. So he uh, looks around the room. Oh, there's uh, a rag. I can right. wipe my hands. He wipes his hands on our pee rag, basically. And, you know, we didn't plan that, and he didn't know but he soiled himself in the degradation of our captivity. And it struck me that that's what happens whenever we enter into a relationship of domination, of oppression, of violence, whatever the reason, because they were doing it to protect their country. Um, they had had their homes bombed. They had people in their families killed. They, were, they had a just reason for doing what they were doing, but still they were soiling themselves in that violence that they were doing to us. Let me pick up on this because it's this is this will be quite remarkable for people to hear from somebody who was held captive for for 118 days. That you're not even not that you're not even angry necessarily at, at times at, at at your captors, but that you think they have a just reason for doing what they did. I, I think many people might expect an experience like this to for you to to challenge your beliefs and shake your faith in peaceful resolutions. It, it wasn't peaceful res resolutions, but military in intervention that ultimately freed you. Mm -hmm. 
but you've retained your commitment to pacifism. Mm-hmm. Uh, how challenging has that been for you? Was there ever a moment where your core values felt shaken? The um, well, I feel it's sort of a paradox that that we went to to Baghdad as pacifist Christian peacemakers, and our hope always was that it would res- be resolved by the captors deciding to release us, and uh, that's not what happened. In fact, they murdered one of us, and um, it was resolved by by the institution of war that we were that we were going there to um, stand against, in a sense. And um, it, um, and I'm sitting here talking to you today because of of because that, of the military who freed of you, the military who intervened, me. yeah. And um, and so, but it's interesting because everything that I experienced and learned in the captivity confirmed the truth of nonviolence for me. Um, and so it, it's a much, this of course is much bigger than just my individual freedom, which is very important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we have to look at this as much, this is the institution of war that we spend $1.5 trillion a year on mm-hmm. in the face of the sixth major extinction of life on our planet, which is underway now, mm-hmm. caused by human activity. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, you're not totally answering answering my question. I, I, I was I was asking about you, your your personal yes. you know, in that moment, in yes. the moment, right? In the moment, in yes. the raw emotion of the moment. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel like I wish I had a big bigger gun or a gun? I wish I wish I could hit back. I, I there is a violent uh, solution to this, and and I want to be part of it. Uh, I did experience that that um, that at times. There was a a moment when. There was a gun the the uh, just kind of left under a pillow it was unattended and i imagined wow if i knew how to use a gun maybe i could you know i didn't know if it was loaded or whatever Mm. could i use it but even in that moment i didn't i never had the desire to kill um and i i sort of thought how could i how could i do this get out get free without actually killing and the the idea of killing uh while the emotion was there in a sense i couldn't it it was really the idea of it was really repugnant to me but i i I have to say i mean when you say it's a paradox um one of the things the the thing i really love about this book is your honesty in you are conflicted throughout this whole situation uh, uh, not just about what to do but about your own beliefs at times uh, and you come out of it uh, almost stronger in your beliefs but but working your way through that you do that in the book for us mm-hmm. you grapple with many moral dilemmas you've faced you write about your great gratitude to the soldiers who rescued you but you were in Iraq to protest the use of military force as you just say mm-hmm. you write that at least one of the soldiers involved in the rescue was angry at you mm-hmm. saying you have no idea how many people were involved how many people risked their lives to get Mm -hmm. you out. Mm -hmm. How did you respond to his feeling and the feeling expressed by other critics that the Christian peacemaker teams put soldiers' lives at risk? Well, the the book, in a way, is is a response. And it's not that there's a, you know, in that moment when that soldier told that to me, there isn't a a sentence that I could say in response. It's a story. It's, It's, I felt like, if I could sit with this man, if I could tell him about Junior and Uncle and Medicine Man, the captors, if I could tell him about Tom and uh, Harmeet and Norman and what we experienced and learned, that that maybe he would see in another way. And, and that I had gone there in a way so that he didn't have to do his job because his job, the job of killing, that... that is um, that's a horrible job. Nobody, nobody should have that work. And it's traumatizing to do that work. And it's the institution of war, this vast thing that's much bigger than any individual person. And um, I really believe if we are going to have a future on this planet, mm. we have to begin dismantling that and... and um, 
relinquishing our trust in it, that it, it can uh, save us. There's, there's interesting human parables that come out of this experience for you, too. You, you talk about the captors watching Hollywood movies and rooting mm-hmm. for the good guys. Mm-hmm. Everybody believes they're on the side of good, mm-hmm. right? It was very clear, like the captors, uh, yeah, I'm sitting there watching uh, Transporter 2, this, you know, uh, junior, the captor called action film, action film. And uh, this this is, uh, you know, the classic good guy, bad guy, uh, the one man martial arts army who, um, you know, is going after the bad guy who's captured uh, this, who's kidnapped this little boy. And Junior's cheering on, you know, go. And I'm thinking like, wow, you're cheering on for the kidnapper bad guy who's, you know, kidnapped this helpless innocent. And he saw himself as the good guy. And the soldiers themselves, I've heard them say, we're here to get the bad guys. We're, and in fact, soldier and insurgent, they're working from the very same story, the same narrative. And that's what happens to us in violence is that we become the thing that we hate. Will you go on another Christian peacemaker mission? I think uh, at some point in this uh, next year, I will, yeah. Would you go back to Iraq? Uh, not to uh, Iraq, but uh, yes. To... The, 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 the subtitle of the book, um, 118 Days in Iraq and the Struggle for a World Without War. This is a big question to ask you with 30 <laughs> seconds left, but how confident are you that a world without war is really possible? Do you think that that's something that we could see in our lifetimes? Yes, I mean maybe maybe not in our lifetimes, maybe in two generations. But like uh, slavery, um, the the vote, the emancipation for women, um, uh, you know, um, uh, equal marriage, uh, things that were unthinkable that we now uh, that we now kind of almost take for granted. And um, I think as a planet, if we're going to survive. We have to find, we do, a different way other than war. I thank you so much for being here. Thanks thank for the you, book. John. I've been speaking with Canadian peace activist James Loney. His memoir of his kidnapping in Iraq is called Captivity, 118 Days in Iraq and the Struggle for a World Without War. James Loney has been with me here live in Studio Q.